and hello everybody you're very welcome to a new brand story episode here on itsp magazine this is sean martin host of redefining Cybersecurity podcast where i get to talk about all kinds of cool things cyber and the cool people behind uh behind the programs and the products and the tools and all the good things that are going on in our industry and as you know if you listen to the show it's all about how to take something and operationalize it for the benefit of the business um not just to manage risk and and uh, reduce exposure. Those are important pieces, which we're going to talk about today. But it's all in in the in the support of generating revenue and protecting that revenue when we generate it. So I'm thrilled today to have Roger uh, Fisher on. Good to see you. Very nice to be here, Sean. It's a pleasure pleasure to have you on, and I'm excited to to learn more about Hadrian and and. It's inception and the uh, the challenges that you help teams overcome. Before we get into what you actually do as the uh, co-founder and CEO of the company, uh, maybe a quick look back to some of the things you've done working up to uh, launching Hadrian. Yeah, I, very quickly. Um, so, so I started out as an ethical hacker. I think as as a lot of people in this industry do. Started out when I was a teenager, uh, primarily focused around Dutch banks, but got my street cred on some of the Hall of Fames of the larger tech companies as well. Um, I really enjoyed offensive cybersecurity or ethical hacking because I, it feels like you're solving puzzles. It's 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 technically complicated, but at the same time, there is there is a very clear goal and sometimes a bit of an adrenaline rush when you finally find something. Um, so yeah, spent spent quite a quite a lot of teenage years there. And rolled into the cryptocurrency game afterwards. Started my own cryptocurrency exchange in 2012, which turned out, uh, in hindsight, was a very good time to start a cryptocurrency exchange. Um, so from 2012 to around 2020, I, I built that company until it was acquired. Um, and it, it became relatively big. We were around 50 people managing uh, slightly more than a billion in crypto assets under management. Um, yeah, so the company got acquired by by a competitor, and I left. Uh, and about a year later, I started Hadrian together with uh, with some good friends of mine that I used to uh, use to hack together as teenagers as well. Nice one. And when you're hacking, I mean, let's just uh, let's just say what, what Hadrian does because you you, uh, you basically help companies eliminate the risk exposure, right? Or minimize the risk exposure. I don't know if we ever get 100%, but I presume how you view this problem is deeply rooted in how you attacked, <laughs> attacked organizations when uh, when you were working as a hacker. Oh, yes, 100%. So so also, you won't, you won't hear me claim that we we solved the problem completely of cybersecurity. I don't think there's, there's any such company out there. Um, what I what I think is what we can give you is a, a is a piece of visibility of how you look like from an attacker's point of view, right? That's where our experience lies, and that's what we automate with Hadrian, where we we believe that by building tooling and then applying AI um, to automate some of these steps as well, um, we we can reach a certain scale of testing that that a traditional methodology just can't traditional pen testing or traditional vulnerability scanning um, which gives you visibility of some of the exposures that you have it's not even about remediation yet i think that that's a very solid next steps but it's it's about getting visibility prioritizing those things that matter most um and then giving the the the, the customer the tools to re remediate that as well so giving them clear guidance on how to solve some of these problems so what are some of the the area. Well, uh, let me pour it before I go there. What, what was the what was the drive to start the company? Was it something you kept seeing over and over and over, or an experience you had, or something your co-founders? Um, yes, experience? it was. It was actually so something that Oliver and I. We, I mean, Oliver went into join another cybersecurity startup after his hacking career, um, and and basically continued his hacking career, whereas I went into the cryptocurrency startup. Um, but we both noticed that the tooling there that, that we used to exploit a lot when you were hacking manually, which was primarily around reconnaissance and, and, and basically finding a full attack surface and then actually using tooling to, to attack those as well, 
um, we, we noticed that a lot of the existing tools in the market, they were too passive in nature, right? They were a bit too worried about actually launching attacks because, well, inherently these tools were more or less focused on uh, third-party risk management or or gaining just a very light touch view of, of your map of your attack surface. So what we know is that- Because they're they were, afraid of knocking something over. They're afraid of knocking something over or they're not confident enough on, on what they've discovered belongs to you and therefore they're not sure if they're allowed to actually run a penetration tests on them, right? Because they, those are more intense and could be legal to run on, on just a random asset. Um, so, so there's a higher degree of certainty required to actually do the automated pen testing part uh, than if you are just doing the, the passive scanning. So the problem with passive scanning is it generates a ton of data, which can be super interesting if you have a team of 20 to go through it and actually monitor. Right? So you, you saw, especially in the finance sector, large security teams being able to actually extract a lot of value out of these tools. Um, but in reality, the, the, the perhaps smaller security teams, especially in industrials and, and, and other smaller uh, medium enterprise, uh, you saw that not being able to really extract the value out of traditional ASM tooling. Um, and that's where actually the automation that follows the uh, comes in, where you, you can combine multiple aspects of offensive security to basically automate the work for them in advance. You know, people can still interact with the data as they used to be before, so they can still have a full view and map of their attack surface. But more importantly, they get a, a pre-digested understanding of what that data actually means to them and what exposures they, they are exposed to. And how, how much detail, because you said some of the existing tools or legacy tools may not go deep enough or broad enough and may not capture enough. Um, what are some of the things that you bring into the picture that gives additional context, additional information, additional intelligence uh, to really help paint a picture that's that's meaningful? So there's two important elements to that. The first one is just asset enrichment based on AI context. And and I, why I'm saying AI context, I don't like the word AI. At Hadrian, we have a very strict policy to only apply AI whenever it actually suits a purpose, right? Because in reality, every time you use AI, you add a lot of computational resource, but you're also adding a lot of statistics around false positives, right? You, you don't know what's exactly going on. So you only add AI whenever you feel it tr truly feel a need that this adds value to the outcome. So AI is great, at, and especially machine learning is great at, at being trained to understand context. So whereas existing tools are, what I would say, one-dimensional. They just run a test, and the test is pre-written, very well-defined, but also not very flexible. If, if slight changes or firewalls in, in, in before the asset, uh, you'll see that the, the results might vary, and it's very prone to false positives. If you add AI into that equation, and you can basically create specific and custom attacks to your, your customer's environments, uh, you'll be able to to massively reduce the, the false positives, but you'll also be able to massively reduce the amount of tests you will have to run in, in any way because of the context that you already know about the asset, you know that the majority of some of these tests are completely useless. So that's one. The second part is around being able to chain together multiple aspects of security testing um, and into um, to basically a, a, a an attack chain that exploits a whole lot of problems at once. So I think proxy shell is probably the most most uh, clear example of this, where uh, in order to, uh, to exploit a proxy shell attack, you abuse three different uh, vulnerabilities. Traditional vulnerability scanners are very good at identifying the individual vulnerability, and they will run a scan, get a true or false on that uh, test result, and then you know whether you're vulnerable. But you're seeing now more and more that the automated pen testing tools in the market, such as Hadrian, they're able to chain these attacks in 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 parallel or in linear fashion, um, in order to execute them fully. And again, here is where where AI comes into play because it, you, there is a requirement of a certain flexibility of how these tools can be chained together. Um, and and again, you want to predict the best way to to accomplish that. Um, and and this is something again. Mm -hmm. a, 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 on, on that point, uh, meaning what? Um, meaning how the the attacker would normally put them together, or how how they how you'd put them together in your environment, or both? 
so so it, it, in 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 reality once we're in in one way that's our main focus so we, we will not try and and prioritize then that there, there, there's a multiple different ways but automatically inherently in how the system works you'll try many many different permutations of different attack paths and that's again something that um is allowed by understanding that context because you know what to test for right in reality so let, let's look at let's say in theory you have about 500 next steps potential next steps that can happen after you run a test. Um, if, if you have five or six of those steps, you already can imagine that the amount of perm permutations and possible iterations are going to be trillions. Um, you don't have your own cloud capacity for that. Cloud costs will go through the roof. But also on the customer end, they will not, they will not necessarily appreciate you running that amount of testing, right? Especially if you want to be able to do this on a continuous level, um, like, like we try to do with, with Hadrian. You basically have to um, bit a certain statistical relevance, understand what is what is needed to test for right now, and what is most likely to re to result in a, in a po positive outcome. A positive outcome being a a successful breach. And successful can be what exploitable, currently exploited, um, signs of indicators of compromise, um, all of those things. It's a good question. No, it's not all of those things because the, the, it's it's a very proactive tool, so to say, right? So we we do not detect when you've been breached. We're, we're um, equivalent to manual penetration testing, but then in an automated scale. Hence, we would always be able to to give you insights around how somebody can breach you. Um, we do have our own threat intelligence integrated as well. So whenever we find a way to get into your environment, we can also say, look, there, there are threat, threat actors that are currently exploiting uh, vulnerabilities like these. Uh, but we, we cannot determine whether you are actually actively being exploited right now. Got it. So so view of where, where the exposure is um, and the ability to yeah, paint a full picture of that exposure based on a, a collection of vulnerabilities that that you've uncovered. Exactly, and what you'll vulnerable. figure out, what you'll figure out, and what we what we see constantly is that, on average, companies that we work with, they have tens of thousands of CVs exposed to the internet, which is what traditional attack service management tools have been telling them. Um, in reality, when you go and actually try and exploit those CVEs or combine the CVEs that that rely on multiple things happening at the same time. Uh, you'll see that there's probably less than 50 that are actually leading to direct exposure to the company. And that's on top of the idea that a lot of, uh, well, a lot of exposure doesn't come directly from CVs and vulnerabilities. I'd say that probably around one in five of our critical findings are just exposed files and credentials um, on, on, on sensitive paths, heap dumps that are exposed, uh, backups that are exposed. And all of these things are, are, are tend to things that perhaps a vulnerability scanner might pick up, but traditional attack service management would not. They often don't even load the, the DOM of a page. Um, and therefore, it, it often falls into this gap where nobody's really looking for it, nobody's really monitoring for it, but it, it leads to a lot of risk and exposure and, 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 and obviously sometimes even very low-hanging fruit in terms of data breaches. So talk to me a bit about, because you mentioned uh, continuous or at least regular um, assessments and scanning. The we, we both know uh, an environment isn't static, right? Things are changing there. Um, Data is changing. Systems are changing, uh, being added, removed. And of course, on the other side, uh, threats aren't uh, aren't slowing down. So expo exploitations are are constantly changing. The, the way they attack, the the the, uh, the way they connect different exploits to, to to do their deed changes as well. How does what you do at Hadrian kind of help stay on top of that? So you have a continuous, but not then just an ever never ending growing list of stuff. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very good question. And especially that your point around environments not being static, right? They change a lot. Um, and that is also why, why manual pen tests that you do every quarter or sometimes even every year, they tend to, to, have problems slip through the gaps during that year or they you introduce problems that you might only figure out much later 
So one of the most important modules that we've developed. So so our 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 system is completely modular, and all those modules they they can interact with each other. One of the first modules that we developer developed is just a detection for change, just to understand has something changed on this asset, and we run that every day. If nothing has changed, we will not rerun all of the tests that we've already done. But if something has changed, we we might decide. Oh well, basically we're seeing that. I don't know, the, the, the server IP has changed or we, we detect a different type of technology supporting um, this environment. And then you restart basically your your whole um, scans. And and we, we call this an event-driven architecture where we, we basically have these events that, that can trigger um, and that can also then interact between these different modules. An event can be something very simple as, as a port opened up. Um, and therefore, we want to retest something. The event can also be external, like you said, where we've already mapped you and and done like the the, the old school attack source management stuff, where we we know what type of technology you're running somewhere, and and at some point there comes out some news around I don't know Fortinet or Palo Alto releasing a zero day into their VPN software. At that point, we already know where you would be running that software. So whenever our threat intelligence implies, look, we have this new vulnerability, you need to start testing for this. Um, we know already exactly where to test for it, and we trigger an event that will only retest that asset for that vulnerability. So instead of doing the whole exercise again, you want to be very specific when you, what you do, because if you are very specific in what you do, you can do it far more often, and thereby um, you can reach that 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 almost continuous level of monitoring. So a big part of this, uh, Clearly, if you, depending on how you have your control set, you might mitigate some of the stuff with, with some controls and, uh, yeah, firewall settings, things like that. Um, but sometimes you can't get away from the, the need to patch, right? And we've seen things like Log4j and others where teams scramble to find them all everywhere and patch them all everywhere. And it may or may be, may not be, uh, that they need to do all of them in every place, right? All at once. Um, might be based on business need, might be based on ex exploitability, might be, um, yeah, might, there might be a, a piece missing in the in the attack chain, right? That says, exactly. well, they might pop that, but they're not gonna get anywhere because of your, your specific environment. So how, tell me how teams that you work with are levering, leveraging what you provide them to be smarter in how they approach their their patch management program and then other other mitigation programs. So, uh, so the first that. first things first, they, they, they use the data just to gain visibility, right? Because that's the first thing that they want, just to understand what what risks am I actively taking, what decisions am I making, and because if you don't have the data to even understand where you might be exposed, where you might run the log4j type software, um, then then you are nowhere and you can't even make a proper risk assessment. Right. So the first thing is just, just knowing what data you have exposed to the internet, knowing where you might be exposed. And then the second part to it is actually that, that exploitability, which is so crucial to understand whether we were able to autonomously create an exploit and execute that or not is a huge driver for priority. If, because quite frankly, if we were not able to, it's, I, I will never exclude that it's not possible. It's just that it's, it means that most likely it's, it's far more complicated and from an automated fashion, you're most likely not going to receive an attack that way. You still might be attacked by somebody manually, but obviously the vast majority of attacks on the internet, they happen already in an automated fashion. So you want to be at least, you're sure that you're, you're well, relatively safe against those ones. Um, and again, that ties back into the, to the, prioritization because if there are automated ways to to get into those systems and we do find a way to to exploit a log4j vulnerability or something like that then obviously that that also tells exactly the, the opposite of the story we're saying look if we can automatically exploit it there's at least 100 threat actors out there that are also running internet-wide scans on on this specific vulnerability trying it in a specific manner um and and one of them is surely just as capable as we are in terms of building our our, our automation around this. So in that, in that sense, it, it, it gives them feedback to, that they should probably look at that one first. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So as, as we wrap here, um, one of the things that always sticks in my mind is we, we do 
there, there's a lot of work right <laughs> involved. There, there are analysts, uh, there, there are teams working together. Uh, you have to collaborate with IT. You probably have uh, a SIM team, a SOAR team. You're you're organizing things with it as well in the SOC. Um, it, it for me, it comes down to how how do you communicate, or how does how do the customers you work with communicate to whomever cares that what we're doing matters, right? And there's the this is such I, I don't a good necessarily question. like the MTTR, MTDD, all that, right? Yeah. All that stuff. But there, how, how do you say probably, it? This is probably the one of my biggest mistakes when starting Hadrian as a company is is underestimating this part of the problem. Whereas, look, my background was an ethical hacker. I wanted to ethical hack. I wanted to reach scale. I wanted to provide you with insights. And the first year and a half when we built our platform, um, we didn't focus on, on that part of the user experience. We didn't focus on providing the user with tools to interact and integrate into existing security controls. And what we noticed was that even though people were buying our software for the, 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 the findings, um, the, the main feedback that kept on coming was like, okay, so but, but it would be so useful if I can just automate some of the work that flows from this. Where, because we were like, yeah, but we're automating the hacking part, and then afterwards, I just want to integrate into your ticketing system, and good luck with it. Um, and what 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 we learned is that often, especially for large conglomerates, subsidiaries, etc., they they also don't have proper ticketing systems, and they they don't often don't they don't even have their own proper security controls to the level that I would expect them to have them sometimes. And and what we ended up saying about a year ago um, was okay, we, we're going to have to focus on building features where uh, you basically take control over the risk management into the platform. One of the first things we launched was just a secure share feature where you can give any email in your organization access to one particular risk, not the rest of the platform, and that person can then interact on that page, on that risk, as if they were a user of our platform. And and this is exactly how you yeah, what you gave as an example. If you, if you're a security engineer, you're not part of of a very large IT team. Usually, you're you're part of a separate team. The IT person of of one of your offices will end up having to resolve the fact that there is a Windows machine outdated, right? So you want them to interact with the platform because you don't you don't want to share these things over email, but you also don't want them to give full access to to the risk and uh, full access to the platform and all the other risks. Um, so about a year ago, we, we really started building features around the workflows that come with risk remediation. Um, and, and I think what, what our next step is in that direction is also to, to automate some of the risk remediation itself. Like you gave examples of integrating into firewall software to block potential attack paths or at least break attack chains in a certain way. Right, so that that's not that's not in in the platform right now, but I can envision that that will be where we're heading with this automation of workflows around uh, risk remediation. I love it. That's uh, uh, it's cool stuff. I uh, I think you're onto something here. Obviously, <laughs> um, and well, I appreciate you telling this story. I mean, just the. I mean, there, there are no lack, no lack of tools. Let's, let's be honest, right? And to your point, uh, they create a lot of noise, and and they're not as not as proactive as they should be. And what I'm hearing is that what you're working on is automating the the mindset of the hacker and uncovering the vulnerabilities, but taking it again from the mindset of a hacker and chaining those vulnerabilities intelligently to say these things can be chained together to to create additional exposure and be exploitable. And uh, that that intelligence and that knowledge, uh, is, I can only imagine, is super helpful. <laughs> exactly, right? And and yeah. I think the big big chunk there is, is that the, the, the tooling that allows us to accomplish a lot of these is, is the recent advancements in AI, right? Yeah. I, 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 I'm not an AI expert myself. We have them in our team, but the fact that we were able to basically generate all these context modules and we'll be able to, to assess what, what an asset even entails, even predict the importance of some of your assets based on, on the interaction you have on your website, that allows us to, to really help you with that prioritization, but also with chaining those attack, uh, those vulnerabilities together, knowing what, what might be relevant to what. Yeah. And for the change management, I think that's another big, big area or event driven uh, re reassessments, if you will, based on changes internally or externally, 
Um, 100%. Uh, yeah, huge, huge uh, insights there as well. Well, Roger, thank you uh, for sharing this Hadrian story with us. I'm, uh, I'm certain people listening are trying to figure out well, how do I, how do I get my hands on this and, and fold it into my program? Uh, you want to, of course, we'll include links to, uh, to your website and we'll, uh, this story and any others you choose to share with us and, and whatnot we'll include in the show notes. Um, but final word for you, call to action, people, how people can connect with you and the team and, uh, and get their hands on a, on a demo or proof of concept. Sean, thank you so much for your time and having me on the on the show here. I really appreciate your your questions. I had a great time. Um, look, we're going to be at many conferences and and we're always ready to speak. Um, also, very easy for us. Look, one of the biggest advantage of a tool like Hadrian is that it runs completely external to your environment. So a POC or a POV doesn't require any time and interaction from your side. And the only thing that we expect from you is that you you remediate some of the findings that we'll, we'll present to you. Uh, but you most likely will be interested in that yourself as well. Um, so please reach out if you feel like your existing attack service management is, is not helping you enough in, in that prioritization question and, uh, and we'll be able to help you. Perfect. All right, there you have it, everybody. Uh, connect with Roger and the, and the Hadrian team and uh, get your assessment started. And I do appreciate everybody listening and watching uh, this brand story here on ITSP Magazine. I appreciate Hadrian telling the story with all of us. Uh, keep well, everybody. Thanks again, Roger. Thank you, Sean. Bye-bye.